you grab your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Book of Exodus, second book in the Bible, chapter 20. We've been talking about our problems. What are your problems? And some of them we've talked about already are, uh, like last week we talked about gluttony. That was a popular one. <laughs> week before that we talked about greed. We've talked about our different problems. This week we're talking about jealousy or envy or covetousness. It's found in the Bible many times. While studying for this message, I was confronted with the question, why does the Bible tell us that God is a jealous God, but in the same passage advises us that covetousness or jealousy is a bad thing? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You ever wondered that? Why is it okay in one vein and it's not in the other? My uh, Sunday school answer, which I think is a right answer, my Sunday school answer is that it's two different kinds of jealousy that is addressed. But I, I could not intelligently back that up until really now. I mean, now it's, I mean, I just knew that it was. I didn't know why it was or what, what I would use if someone asked me that question, and no one has ever asked me that question. Um, so I imagine we don't lose a lot of sleep over this. There are just some things in God's Word that you just, you look at and you go, I'm not going to question that, I'm just not going to do it. Ten Commandments is one of those places, you, you can't really argue with that, it says this, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, you know, okay. That's pretty plain and simple. We don't have to break down that definition much. But I think that jealousy, covetous, covetousness, I think that we do need to break that down a little bit. We need to look at that a little further. I want to say, though, before we even get deeper into this, is I, I'm sure that you're tired of hearing over this series how bad of people you are, huh? All of your problems that I'm bringing to mind. But let me first remind you that you gave me the topics <laughs> that we're addressing, first of all. And I would add that if you have other topics that you want to address, as we're coming close to the end of this series right now, if you have other topics that are just burning on your heart that you want to address, I think you should write them down and hand them to me so I'll remember them or shoot me a text or send me an email. Call me if you want to. And, and let me know that there's this topic that I'd like to address. And that's perfectly fine. I'll do my best uh, to do so. I do glean from a lot of different uh, authors and pastors uh, in reference to these topical things. Our next move after we finish this series is to go into a, more of a book study and then come back with something. As I was in Sunday school this morning with Scott and Annette and with the college age group, uh, we talked about arguing this morning. Many of you talked about it. Is that what you guys were on, Nate, and you guys and the youth? And, and so we were talking about arguing, basically, from Romans chapter 14, correct? All right, verse 1. And, and it just made me think about it. I asked the question, what's the difference in arguing and debate? You ever thought about that? And, and we had an answer. Annette had a great answer. And uh, we, had, we had this answer. And, and we're going to, I think we're going to look at that at some point. The art of debate. Because there's something to think about. But anyway, I go back to, I chase that rabbit. Not only did you give me these topics, but this other thing is that uh, the problem we address is not going to be addressed only in a negative light. I, today, I want to address it in a positive fashion. Actually, I'm going to tell you that you need to be jealous. You're like, wait a minute, Matt. The, the scripture just specifically says, we're going to read it in just a second. It specifically says not to covet. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, yes, that's correct. But I'm also going to tell you, the end of this sermon, we need to be jealous. And I'll explain that further. Um, it's not really a way that you might think. So Exodus chapter 20. I know you just sit down. Did you get your rest on your legs? So now stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'm going to read the entire passage, entire chapter. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who, you brought, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. 
You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to, the, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male, your female servant, your cattle, your sojourner, who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, there is no description necessary on those, is there? God described all those above and, and gave some breakdown of what he thought. But on those right there, it's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? Verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let's back that up just a minute. Let's contemporize it. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not lust after your neighbor's wife. You shall not wish that you had a butler or a housekeeper in your house like your neighbor has. Don't even think about wanting your neighbor's car or their motorcycle or their cool bicycle or their four-wheeler or their golf cart. Don't want their things. Basically, you shouldn't want anything your neighbor has. All right? Verse 18, all the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. That's because God was speaking. And that's when he was speaking, the earth was trembling. That needs to be in our life, you know. You need to take serious the word of God and realize that it needs to shake your life up a little bit. There needs to be thunder and lightning when God's speaking to you. It ought to turn you on your heels and help you to walk away from what's troubling you. Verse 19, then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall make an altar of earth for me. You shall, not, you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings, your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it, and you shall not go up by, my, by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. There's a practical reason there. You know, they wore holy underwear, sort of. And so, you know, if they go up those steps, they could see up uh, under their garment. There's a practical reason for that. That's the entire Exodus chapter 20. We'll read further in just a moment, but I'm going to let you be seated. May God bless the reading of His Word. Amen? In that passage we just read, I'm going to contend for you, there are three types of jealousy that is addressed there. Two of them are very obvious. The third one I'm going to point out to you, but uh, the first type is found in verse 17. We're going to start with the 10th commandment. David Smith uh, from a website called bettersermons.org. He, he observed this. The Ten Commandments almost begin at, verse t at number 10, as if it is a starting place and not an ending. It's possible that the entire war between God and Satan, the beginning of this whole mess that we call sin, had its beginning with the idea of coveting. I mean, consider this. Consider the pairing of it all. If we want something... If we covet something from someone else, we have a tendency that we might want to steal it. 
If we desire someone else's spouse, adultery happens. If, if we feel the need for something that isn't ours, we, we might lie to get it. And if we are jealous of our own time and we want to earn more time, then we ignore the Sabbath day. We ignore the gathering together of the saints. We ignore it because we've got something better to do and it's more important to us. And we're number one. And so we're going to do that. See, everything seems to start with number 10. You've heard of Strong's Concordance, I assume. Some of you have. Strong's Concordance describes a word called pleonexia. Pleonexia is derived from a word that means numerically more. And there's a suffix on there, that exia part of it. That suffix means to have. So properly it's defined as, from the Greek, is the desire to have more things. Lusting for a greater number of temporal things, temporary things that go beyond what God determines as eternally best. In other words, it's wanting beyond what His preferred will is in your life. Are you following me? Pleonexia. J.I. Packer, the author of a popular book that's been popular for a long time called Knowing God. J.I. Packer defines jealousy as an infantile resentment springing from unmortified covetousness, which expresses itself in envy, in malice, and in meanness of action. In other words, you want it, and since you can't have it, no one else can have it either. And so you act upon that in meanness. You act upon that in covetousness. You act upon that in envy. You act upon that with malice. In other words, you intend to do harm because you can't have it. Anybody, you know anybody that way? If they can't have what you have, if they can't have what they want, then no one's going to enjoy it. So they'll destroy it or they'll destroy the possibility of someone else having it. There's nothing but evil that's involved with that. Do you agree? Ray Pritchard in his sermon called The Sin That No One Admits, declares that covetousness actually begins at home. In fact, if we look at the 10th commandment in verse 17, do you understand that it mentions the word neighbor three times? Coveting occurs when I desire something I have no right to, like my neighbor's wife. Or, or when... The desire becomes the controlling portion of my life. So that I begin to believe that my happiness is only contingent. It only depends upon the acquisition of whatever my neighbor has. And it's not just your neighbor as in physical location. It could be the person to your right or your left. You look over and you're like, oh, I like their Bible. Hmm. I sure wish I had their Bible. Got a nice Bible there. Sounds like a Christian pickup line, doesn't it? Ooh. I'm giving you some hints. Covetousness, envy, jealousy. That is the root of all other sins. Paul addressed this in Romans chapter 7. And in Romans 7, he wrote about let me get to it. My fat fingers. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 9. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, and then he goes on to use this as an example. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. He goes on, just, he's talking about the fact that, you know, if we didn't know it was wrong, it would be fine to covet. But we know it's wrong. The, the law makes it very clear. And so apart from the law, I wouldn't have known about sin. He was talking about this, this chain that he was carrying around. So if coveting is so bad, as described in the 10th commandment, if it's so bad, why does the Bible tell us that our God is a jealous God in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 20? 
And that's the difference. We have sinful jealousy, which was talked about in chapter 20, verse 17. And then we have a divine or a sanctified jealousy. And that's what we have with God. See, God is jealous for his people. God is jealous for his creation. God is jealous for his children who are the bride of Christ. And we dare not cheat on him and break his heart. We must be of the realization that his jealousy is beyond our superficial desire for someone else's stuff. This burning desire. We sing this song, Oh How He Loves. We're going to sing it again in just a little bit. It, it goes, you know, He is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of the afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how wonderful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. See, he's jealous for me. He desires me so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul describes this burning desire for the church in Corinth. And his desire for them was that they abide in the love of God. They abide in this divine jealousy, not envy that the church would have what the world has. He didn't care about that. The church doesn't need what the world has because what the world has is nothing but temporary. What your neighbor has is nothing but temporary. Naked you came into this world and naked you shall leave it. There, there is nothing in this world that you need for eternity. So he doesn't describe an envy that the church would have what the world has, but that the church would consume itself. That burning desire thought again. The church would consume itself with a desire for God. In the Old Testament, God expresses his love for Israel by proclaiming to be this jealous God that he talks about in verses 4 and 5. And this doesn't mean envious at all. This indicates his strong love for you, his chosen people. That's who you and I are, his chosen people. In the New Testament, God expresses his love for all of the world by sending his very part of himself in His Son, Jesus Christ, His only Son, who dies on the cross for you and for me. Why would He do that? That we, His children, would be bought back. He bought back what was already His. Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't to you and I because we look from a temporal mindset. But He's looking at it from an eternal point of view. And he loves us so much. I'm telling you today, we are not to be jealous where we covet what another has, which we have no right to obtain in the first place. But God has full right and all majesty to rule over our hearts, you see. And so our response is to be described by a spirit of jealousy, manifested as another similar sounding word. Have you ever heard the term to be zealous? It's similar to jealousy. It's an outright expression of it. And to find this, you look in Exodus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26. Jealousy. Is expressed in this way. The Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. And then he goes on to say, this is the action part of this. You shall make an altar of earth for me and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. And he goes on to describe some of those and the way that's done. Jealousy or zealousy, I guess, for the things of God. That's what we see here. 
God describes how worship of Him is to be different from that which man already requires when they make up their gods. You see? They have in their mind, well, this is what a God would like, and so this is what we're going to do for that God. I'm going to make the finest altar ever. I'm going to hewn it out of stone with my own tools, is what God's saying. Don't do that. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, you might defile it. How would you defile something that you made for God? How would we defile this church that we want to make so beautifully that we do it so people look at it and go, look how wonderful those people of Journey Church are. Look how they do those things for themselves. Instead of saying, the church is God's place of worship. And we make it pretty, we make it clean, we make it beautiful, we take care of it, not because it makes us look good as a church, but we take care of God's house because it is God's house and it deserves the respect that only a place of God should receive. Amen? So we have to be careful with this kind of thing. If we're doing it for our glory, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. That's why God was saying, don't hewn it with stone, don't hewn that stone because you might turn around and say, look what I did. Instead of God saying, look, I don't need that. It's the same way he told David. You don't need to fix me up a beautiful house. You're fine dwelling in that tent right there. I'm perfectly happy with that because I'm the center of it. You see? So we have to be careful with these things. He, he describes how when people are to come to him, they present on purpose. They present with an action. And they, they have a drive to rightly do what God wants them to do. And this is the epitome of zeal for God. See, so the difference in the definition of covetousness to zealousy or zeal, envy versus zeal for God is staggering. And God's word illustrates it well. In the Hebrew, the word is kinah. And in the Greek, the word is zelos. It carries with it the root meaning of warmth, of heat. The Hebrew word paints a picture of redness of face that accompanies a strong emotion, jealousy, do you see? What if we, as a church, what if we were jealous in the name of God in the same passionate way we are jealous for the things of others? What if we expected for God so much so that it turned our faces red and created a heat inside ourselves when the world tries to strip away from God what is rightly God's. What if? Because I know I'm not that way often, though I should be. And I would venture to guess that you probably would agree with me. But what if we were jealous in the name of God for the same passion, passion in the same passionate way that we are jealous of other things on this earth. I want, to dis I want to tell you a story about a man named Phinehas. And you find his story in Numbers chapter 25. So if you want to turn over a couple of books to the book of Numbers, find chapter 25. I'll give you the background. People of Israel are in a certain place. They're in a place in their travel. They're in a place in, in their relationship with God. And, and they had started to turn away from Him. They actually began to worship a different God. This God was named Baal. You see that term utilized a lot in the Old Testament. This is Baal of Peor. So it's the God of, of Peor. Okay? And it's a pagan God. And they must have enjoyed the way that the people of Peor or that, that region were worshiping. And so they started to entwine themselves with it. They gave a little bit. They, they became lax in their worship. And then eventually they kind of turned their, their selves from God. And verse 3 begins. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And the Lord was angry against Israel. He was angry. He was jealous of what was going on there. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Some should die so that God doesn't take out all of Israel. 
you can judge that all you want to. You could say, God must not be a loving God if he's going to do that. You could do that. But I would tell you that God is so loving that he was willing to take out some leaders so that the people would be saved. But we won't go there right now. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And then behold, one of the sons of Israel, picture this, God has them all there. Moses has them all before, them, before him and, and they're casting judgment upon those who had made their offense and all of that's going on. And up through the middle of the crowd strolls a man from Israel with his woman on his arm. Oh well, let's talk about it biblically here. What he says is, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel. He is parading himself before them while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. This dude is celebrating the fact that he has a, a new lover. Phinehas, verse 7. The son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it. And he arose from the midst of the congregation and he took a spear in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent. He pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. And those who died by the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Get this. This is the zeal. Of Phinehas. This is how the Lord looked at it. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy and therefore say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Our first response is this. To all of this is to be zealous for God. Again, J.I. Packer, he wrote this. The jealousy of God requires us to be zealous for God. Our right response to God's love for us is to love Him, right? Our right response of God's love to us is to love Him back. Are you following me? That's our right response. God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, the least we can do is love him back. And so too, our right response to his jealousy over us is to be jealous for him. Is this boring to you? This is real. I'm about to give you the most practical aspect of this whole what's our problem thing. See, we may not go out and slay every non-Christian physically. That would be a bad thing, would you say? We'd obviously gain a bad name pretty quickly, and it wouldn't be to honor and glorify God. You're a non-Christian? Grab my spear. That would not work out so well, Shanika. It wouldn't. But I'm going to tell you this. It's just as deadly for us to help one lost sinner die to their old self and to be raised and walk, to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our practical aspect of this today. We need to have enough zeal in our life to go and slay the non-Christian of their old self and to allow them to be raised to walk in newness of life. That's what we are called to do as evangelical Christians today. Those who share the good news of Jesus Christ is to save someone out of the muck and mire of their life and show them what it means to live eternally with Christ the King. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how we're supposed to be jealous. Our second response is that we as a church, as a whole, are to be zealous for God and to not be in, uh, and to not be is a threat against our existence as a church. If we are not moving forward in the way that God pronounces for us to do so, then we might as well shut the doors right across the top of the door, close for business. Because these people had something different completely in mind than what God had for them. You see it in Revelation chapter 3 where God talks about the church of Laodicea. It's that church that was lukewarm, the elves, right? The Laodicean church was lukewarm and God said about them, 
I would just spit you out. Because who likes something that is lukewarm? If it's supposed to be hot, it needs to be hot. The word for zeal, zealous, kina, means warmth. It means a heat. We are called to be a zealous church. Because if we're not, we're going to get spit out. Indicating that lack of zeal as a church is an offense to God. It is time, church, that we stop worrying about what so-and-so has and what we have not. And instead, we need to rise up and call, uh, we, we need to live the call of God in our life to demand the fear of God from those around us to be exhibited by those that we surround ourselves with. Because He is a jealous God and we are to be His jealous people. And our focus is to be on eternity and not on the temporary things of the world. Things which do not satisfy us. Because you might obtain it today, but tomorrow you're going to be bored with it. You might get what you want today that you just can't live without, that you just hunger and you burn for. But tomorrow you will not want it. You will cast it aside. You may never touch it. But I'm telling you this, if you're not on fire for God, if you are not deep down sold out to the love of Jesus Christ and to the blood of Him that is over you, then you will not have eternity because it is not promised you if you are not a child of God. Consider this today, that we are to be a jealous people, but our jealousy is strictly reflected upon God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's stand together. Father, I pray that you will help us, Lord. Help us to realize what is most important to you. Our relationship with you, our love for you, our stand in your name. We are not to be walked on. We are to be your church. And God, I'm afraid that we haven't been that way consistently. So I pray for consistency this morning. I pray that we walk the walk, we talk the talk, we live a life that is worthy of your calling in our lives. God, everything that we do and say will be for your honor and glory and not for making ourselves to look better, not for causing our uh, position to be increased in this world. So God, we need to ask forgiveness. So this time of invitation is just that, God. That we can come before you and we can lay it all down. Some of us need a closer walk with you. All of us need a closer walk with you. Some of us need to humble ourselves before you. Ask for your forgiveness and ask for your help that as we move from this place and Satan tries to attack that you would put a protection around us that God, we could just stay in your grace. We could stay in your peace. We could stay in your love. We could stay in your presence for much longer than just the time that we're here at church worshiping together. Your word is not boring. This situation in our life is not boring. In fact, we are in battle right now. So God, open up the heavens now and rain your power down upon us, God. Anoint us with your presence. God, we worship you because you're worthy of worship. Church, in this time, Chip's going to be here at the front to receive you. I'll be at the back with Matt. And if you need to talk or you need to, to pray, we'll meet you back there. Chip will be here at the front to receive you and pray for you and pray with you time of invitation is for you. It's time that you understand jealousy. Jealousy for God is what you're called to be. You don't need anything else. Nothing else is necessary. Because everything else will work out.